Hey everybody, hope everybody's doing well and welcome to this week's q and I've got a bunch of questions and one over on Floatplane, so I'm going to start over there. Clint Collage had two questions. I'm going to answer the second one first because I think it's a little easier. Um, Clint has an analog NT, the original, not the mini, that's displaying a gray screen regardless of the game, which started after a young child spit some water into the cartridge slot. Ouch, that happens. Um, this happened when the console was off, but still plugged in. I unplugged it immediately and turned it upside down so any water would drain out, and I left it dry for maybe a week before attempting to power it on. I later opened it up and didn't see any res uh, residual mineral deposits or any visual indication of damage. I cleaned the cartridge slot, which didn't make any difference. I did some digging online, and it sounded like this may be a symptom of a bad CPU. Would I agree with that, or is there something else I could check first? Um, these basically have Kevtris's high def nest board built in, so they should be able to swap that out if they could pick up a donor. So there's a few things with that. Uh, just some tips, if possible, in the future, if that ever happens. Yes, yank the power out immediately, uh, but then disassemble it um, and leave it disassembled to dry. And uh, I mean, theoretically, the best thing you could do is leave it under a UV light, but not many people have those. So I tend to leave mine in the sun for a while. Every time I say that out loud, there's somebody that, that goes off on me saying, oh, you can't leave your stuff in the sun. That's really bad for it. it could do other things, but it's already wet, right? So, you know, I wouldn't leave it in there for a day, but I'd certainly, um, like I'd tap out the circuit board, I'd hit it with compressed air, and then I would leave it in the sun for at least 20 minutes or so. Um, not so much for the light, but just for the UV rays once again. But if the power was plugged in, a bunch of things could have been happening to that. So, um, you know, maybe it shorted something on the way in. You would really have to trace it out piece by piece. And you could start pulling parts and testing that stuff out. But without a bunch of replacement parts, uh, it's going to start to get really costly. So I would see if you could contact Analog and see if they're still repairing these. Um, and if not, uh, I would contact somebody that already has a bunch of parts. So this goes kind of to what I always try to tell people in that even if you can do a lot of these mods yourself, it's often better to have, when I say a professional, like somebody that does this on a regular basis for, you know, even for a living possibly, because they're probably going to have a stack of nest parts laying around and they're going to have all the desoldering tools and be able to to do what your average person could do in a few hours versus a few days because you don't have to order parts off eBay and all that other stuff. So without seeing it in person, without being able to trace things down piece by piece, I really wouldn't know um, what the issue is. And because there's custom stuff on there, I would just contact analog. So sorry, it's kind of a cop out answer, but it is kind of the safer thing to do. And Clint's second question is, can I give an update on how the retro RGB channel has grown over the past year and any predictions for the next year? Am I any closer to making this a full-time gig? Lawn TV does this yearly and I really enjoy hearing how channels I enjoy are progressing. So I'm usually very excited to talk about these things, but with everything going on, everything might change. So I'll kind of give an overview of like what's, what I've been doing, what I, what, what I would like to do and you know, let me just start from there, I guess. So I actually have been doing this full time for almost two years. Um, it's kind of a very long story as to how that happened, but I ended up getting, um, getting some support that allowed me to continue doing this. Uh, and that extra support allowed me to continue doing my favorite part of all of this, and that's helping other developers. Um, now, I'm just by no means trying to take any credit away from anybody. It's just a matter of a lot of times these developers that are much smarter than me are about to start a project or are halfway through a project, and they hit a road bump, and they go, all right, this is like 20 hours worth of research in order to get the answer to this, or I could just call Bob and sit on the phone for an hour because he's already been through all this last year. So, um, you know, I, I, that's my favorite thing to do. I love making products and I also pride myself and I keep everybody secrets. I don't, you know, I'm always honest and transparent about all that stuff. So I think even developers that don't like me still are okay working with me because because <laughs> I do enjoy helping uh, regardless. So that's my, my favorite thing to do. Um, and of course, you know, I did all the stuff that you see is uh, in front of the camera. Like I, I've been trying to do three videos a week consistently. So one fancier video, the weekly podcast and the Q and A's. Um, and of course, all the articles and behind the scenes stuff on the website, which takes a lot more time than, than one would expect. So, um, you know, unfortunately, I had a plan 
for this year. I had a very solid plan that was going to to be laid out throughout 2020 that I was going to announce on the 200th podcast. Uh, And I was very excited about all of that. But with everything going on now, all of that got put on hold because I'm honestly not really sure what's going to happen. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess all of us are in the same boat. So I think that retro RGB would, would be fairly safe to continue because there's pretty amazing supporters that have been writing articles and helping out behind the scenes. So regardless of what happens to me, the website and the weekly podcast are probably going to keep going for as long as you can imagine, uh, you know, hopefully. Um, it's just my involvement in it is what's up for question. You know, I would love to continue doing this full time. I'd actually love to concentrate even more on development work and less on videos because I do love the videos but the videos are the videos are twofold they're either a general video in order to bring more people in and introduce them to the hobby because I think every time I do a more general thing like the Xbox video you know uh, out of all the new people that have never seen the channel before most of them go oh cool thanks for the info and that's it you know maybe throw me a a subscribe and a like because that's always free But that might also draw in people that didn't know a lot of this other stuff existed and they're super excited and want to basically want to become a part of the rest of the stuff that we do. And the hope is for that to always grow the support channels like Floatplane and Patreon. So that's the goal with those. Uh, My favorite videos are the ones that are weird. Like I think my favorite video I've ever done is the direct RGB video capture, which was like... 80 hours worth of work total from the time I started the project to the time I, you know, threw out making the video and everything else. Most of it research, of course, because the video wasn't that fancy. Um, But, you know, that got... That got like a thousand views, but 800 out of the thousand were people that really, really wanted to know the information presented that way. Because while there's amazing people like Epos Vox out there that can help you with everything in your stream, I don't know if he's ever done direct RGB capture videos. So that's my favorite videos to make. A little on the fancier side, but super in-depth and technical. Um, And then, of course, I do always love the Q&As and the weekly podcasts, but those are a lot more laid back. Um, So... As for the predictions for the next year, uh, in a perfect world, I would find a way in order to continue to do all this stuff. Uh, but with everything that's going on, everything everything's off the table until we figure out what the heck's going on. And I still might have to to move again in a few months. Which that that the why I have to move has nothing to do with any of the crap going on. That was just a normal thing, and you know leases and everything going up and down in price. But you know, with stuff going on, how is that going to affect it? So unfortunately, while I normally love talking about all the stuff that I do and all the behind the scenes, how retro RGB works and, you know, what I would like to do, this one's a bit of a bummer because while I think I just described kind of what I do on a day-to-day basis, I have no idea what that's going to turn into in the coming months. So uh, fingers crossed to everybody. If you're, um, if you're a supporter and you're going through a rough spot, you know, by all means, cancel or or put your Patreon account on hold. Like, you know, that's your own well-being is more important than any of these content creators, myself included. Uh, But if you're lucky enough to have a job, still support and then possibly tell your friends because it's uh, now's the time for all creators to that would really need some extra help. Uh, Because just the fact is, it's, you know, without stuff like this, a lot of us couldn't do what we do. And it's a little frustrating sometimes because I hear a lot of people, even people that I I genuinely like, say things like, everybody with the Patreon is uh, an unemployed millennial living in their parents' basement making baskets. And it's like, everybody I know with the Patreon works really, really hard. So... Uh, fingers crossed we could still all do this stuff. Uh, if you're already supporting, you're awesome. If you're listening to this for free and you still have a job, maybe consider signing up for uh, a bunch of people's. You know, Smoke Monster has one, and I have one. All the Mr. Developers have them. So, you know, if, uh, if you have the ability to throw a buck a month, why not, right? So hopefully that was a, a good enough description and as much as I could say for now as to the answer to your question. Now over on Patreon, Orlando Lewis said they're a fan of a particular feature on the Mega SG, the dither blending algorithm. They like having the sharpness of a digital signal without seeing obvious dithering in many titles. Do I think it's possible to implement a similar algorithm in HDMI mods for systems like the Ultra HDMI and the upcoming PS1 HDMI? If so, how soon do I believe it'll be implemented? Uh, Well... I don't know if it's possible because I don't know how that would be detected. Um, There was a a video a while back I talked about in the weekly podcast that kind of 
talked about how Sonic the Hedgehog was made and what each layer of the video does. Um, so in order to do stuff like that, you would need to figure out which layer is doing the dithering and then blend that layer or just blend the whole image. But that's when you get a lot more uh, softness where it shouldn't be. So I think it's something that's a lot more complicated than just a filter. Like um, the filter on the Rad 2X and the RetroTINK products, that's just a flip it on, doesn't add any lag type of thing. Whereas this, you know, it, that requires a different kind of, uh, a different kind of way of attacking the signal, I guess, is the better way to describe it. So you would have to do an analysis of how each console does it. Is it always the same layer? Is it different layers? Is it different for each game, which it is for the Genesis? So I don't know if that's something that'll ever be implemented um, or if it'll ever be flawlessly implemented because you would have to write, uh, you would have to basically write code for each game to tell where in each game is the layer that requires the blending. So um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody will come up with a very cool algorithm that'll figure it out. But as of now, every time I've asked that question, it was basically a, yeah, we're not there yet type of thing. So sorry. So apparently last week I was kind of close on the pronunciation of an awesome sounding name. I believe it's close to Shuror. Um, and apparently Shurer's from the Faroe, Faroe Islands, which uh, I remember seeing him on a map, but I didn't really know where that was until I met the band Tear, one of the bands I was in a while back. Um, the lead guitarist got to know those guys. Um, I've seen them a bunch of times live, and a couple, I absolutely love two of their songs, uh, Blood of Heroes and Hold the Heathen Hammer High. Those are two amazing songs. So when you said you were from the Faroe Islands, I was like, oh shit. I've never met anybody else from there except for, for the band. So very cool. Uh, I like, I know this always sounds cheesy when I say it, but I love how stuff like this makes the world feel smaller. So thanks for your comment and uh, good luck with the cell and the frame meister. Um, you know, I agree. Uh, probably hold on to it as long as you can, but if you can't get an OSSC Pro or if it doesn't come out soon enough, yeah, it's for your average person, a retro tank 2X and an OSSC might be a better choice as long as your TV is compatible with the OSSC. So uh, anybody who wants to know more on that, I elaborated more last week. I was just excited to talk to another person from the Faroe Islands. The GOAT says they have a Nintendo Virtual Boy and Furtex Virtual Tap board, but haven't installed it. Is there a good no-cut mod for the RGB output? I think people were planning on rewiring the serial port as an AV port, but where can I get a SCART cable with the appropriate connector? Um, I don't know if anybody figured out a good no-cut mod for it. I think what most people are doing is cutting the bottom of the plastic and using an 8-pin mini DIN socket uh, as well as a VGA connector. Some people were trying to use a Super Nintendo style multi out or a Genesis 2, and it was the same problem that I always warn people about, and most people don't listen in that those cables for Super Nintendo and Genesis have components in them. So, in order for those cables to work properly, you would then need to make the virtual tap output the wrong signal. So, because that's you would need then the cable and the components in it to correct the signal. So your end point, you know, the end of the SCART cable is the signal that you need. So that's why I always say use that eight pin mini din for the weird stuff because it's just a pass through. So, and you also, you know, if the pin out is out there for everybody, but if yours go by and people don't know what's what you could, you know, anybody with a, an oscilloscope could tap RGB pretty easily and be able to figure it out. So, uh, as far as no cut, though, I don't know anybody that's done it. Um, if you know in any way, let me know. I think somebody uh, somebody used the screw port and then had a cable dangling down, but uh, I think they still had to do some kind of cutting, so I just decided to have the connectors added to mine. My Virtual Boy was already kind of beat up anyway, so I didn't feel as bad. Um, so, yeah, sorry. TJ said they have a PS2 and are trying to figure out the best simple HDMI solution. The Rad 2X is nice, but lower resolution. Pound looks pretty good, ugh, but has the normal color and sharpness issues and lag. Don't forget about lag. Uh, the Kaiko has been the best so far for clarity, but has interlacing and juddering issues um, to the point where games like DOA 2 are almost unplayable. Maybe that's just what I could expect. Any tips? Uh, so I went over this in very great detail in the PS2 Rad 2X video. Just search YouTube for Retro RGB Rad 2X and you'll see the PlayStation video come up. So I'll give you the short version here and that video has all the details you need. Um, for 240p and 480i, 
the Rad 2X is still the best. And I, I really suggest you leave that with the smoothing filter on because it really helps for 480i and it helps the 3D graphics. And um, uh, as far as PS2 goes, I don't really know. I guess I would only turn off the filter switch if you're playing a 2D style game. Um, but that's the best for those. For the very few that support a 480p resolution, the best solution is getting a set of HD retrovision cables and just a very cheap component to HDMI converter. Same one that I linked to in the last Xbox video, same one that's on my Amazon page that's linked here. Um, but that is a bit expensive because then you got to buy two things. So that comes to, you know, uh, I think it'll come to like 40 bucks or something. I believe the Kaiko adapter uh, does pass 480p, but Kaiko is also the company that uh, reverse engineered and stole a bunch of stuff, including uh, parts of open source projects that were closed and then threw it in everybody's face saying, oh, but it's an open source project. So it's, uh, I don't, I refuse to support anything they do. And, you know, they, they're, the way they've handled everything was disgusting, especially in a, a small community like this where you could just, email people. I mean, we're not Sony and Nintendo. You could just email the developers and work with them and get stuff made. Uh, Kaiko had a choice. They could have chosen to be that company that takes all these open source designs that nobody else is making and make them for us. And if they had done that, they would have been heroes. I would have been talking about how awesome it is that a company took the time to take these designs, improve them, you know, re, uh, resubmit their changes to the open source license as, you know, to be compliant. Uh, you know, and I don't think it, even in a situation like that, that most people would, would reproduce it. You know, it's, I think they could have been heroes to the retro gaming community. Community. And instead, they chose to reverse engineer products that are still being sold. Um, and once again, take projects that are made part open source, part closed source, and just clone the whole thing and then throw it back in people's faces. So I've talked publicly about that. I had another project where I was going to really go into detail about the things that they did, but that had to get put on hold for a bunch of other reasons. So it's just, it is what it is. But um, I, I can't even begin to tell you how pissed off I am at that company and how awful it was that they took advantage of people. So I am not trying to shame your purchase. There, you know, if you hadn't known beforehand, there's no way you could tell, but um, yeah, I just, I refuse to support anything Kaiko does. So if it were my personal choice, I would use the Rad 2X for absolutely everything except 480p. Um, and in that case, I would switch over to the HD Retrovision component video cables for the PS2 and just a basic HDMI converter. Um, it'll boot in 480i mode, so your TV will, you know, look a little weird. And then once it goes into 480p, everything will look you know, pretty good because it's progressive. So please check out the PlayStation Rad 2X video for all of the details, including why the pound cable sucks so much. Um, and if you're listening to this, unless you're trolling, uh, don't, <laughs> don't support Kaiko. I get a lot of trolls. For, I think it's them a lot, to be honest with you. A lot of the trolls that try to jump in on their defense, I'm pretty sure it's them because I don't think anybody... I don't think anybody would really take their side in that when they, they cloned products from small companies, but we'll see. We'll see when this video goes live to the public, how many, uh, how many of Kaiko's clone accounts are posting on it. <laughs> Heinrich has a PS2 that has a C-Sync mod done to it that's now working perfect in all resolutions through a G-SCART light, but now they have an Xbox with a SCART cable wired for component. And I actually purposely didn't talk about this in the Xbox video because I didn't want to confuse beginners. Uh, so if you're a beginner, uh, just try and keep up. I'm so sorry. It's, this should be a, a longer explanation. Um, but basically, uh, Rob from Retro Gaming Cables made a SCART cable that is essentially a component video cable with a SCART head on it. So it's a component video signal it's just got a SCART head so people could route a component signal through their SCART devices. Um, this works fine with a brand new G SCART switch. Uh, this works with the oldest models where you could just leave it in one port. But the G SCART switch light can't auto detect component video, so it can't pass it through. Um, none of these devices convert it, so you're kind of stuck. So you're, the choices you have are um, they're pretty interesting because you'd have to, they're, they're going to cost money. I don't think there's any free choice that you could, uh, you could kind of do with this, but you have a few things you could do. Um, you could do some kind of, you can get just component cables for the Xbox or a VGA box for the Xbox. 
and then make your own custom cable that combines H and V sync with a simple circuit. Just Google like a sync combiner circuit. Steve from HD Retrovision posted a great article on that, which I talked about on Retro RGB. So you could just I think uh, search Retro RGB for HD Retrovision. I think it might even be the last thing. So you would essentially then go from component to VGA and then VGA just combining H and V sync to S and there you go. Now you have RGBS and you could run that right through the GSCART switch light. Uh, that shouldn't be too expensive. Uh, you might even be able to mod, do the full sync combining mod right inside a VGA box if you could find one of those. You could probably try to mod the Xbox for VGA and then have a, you know, have the sync combiner built in and wire RGBS to the Xbox's output. Um, so there's a bunch of different choices that all require modding and would all change the signal. Um, if you have any other devices that are component video that you plan on using, another thing might be picking up a G comp switch um, and then just running component into that and then doing what a lot of people have been doing, go from the G comp switch into the retro tink transcoder that goes component to SCART and then plug that into the GE SCART switch. And I actually, I showed this a while back. I didn't even realize this, but I have another prototype in of the SCART coupler. So stuff like this is perfect. You would just put this in like one of the back input of the G SCART, put the transcoder right on top of it, and there you go. Now it's a cableless solution. I think these will be available somewhat shortly. So as you can see, there's electrical tape on it. So, uh, you know, still don't have an official case, but that is working good. And as long as you have good cable management, it won't break anything. Obviously, if you have all the pressure on the cables pulling down on it, you could break your pins. But if you just have the cable running straight down, it's perfectly safe. So that's another solution. Um, you could, of course, try to get a different switch to go from the G-Comp into, you mentioned the Hydra Mini, and then out from there. But if you're going to spend the money on that, I think it would be more beneficial for you to spend the money elsewhere uh, and just get a solution that, that works with all the equipment you already have. Um, I haven't spent much time with the Hydra, but I've spent uh, probably an, uh, an unhealthy amount of time testing all of the G-Scarts, uh, and the light and the newest one are, are pretty much perfect. I mean, you're not going to get any signal quality loss at all. So you already have something amazing. I would make, I would try to find a way to make your setup work with it. So. The easiest possible options would be uh, a VGA box with a sync combiner and then just a custom cable um, or modding, possibly modding the Xbox itself. Uh, I don't know anybody that's done that, but it's got to be possible because I've seen internal VGA mods for it before. So uh, sorry, there's no easy answer for that one, but that's a, kind of a cool but complicated question. Travis Baker said they have an Emerson CRT that has YCBCR inputs and wants to know if those are usable. I would plug in component video and see what happens. Uh, should work okay. Depending on the TV, you said it has a digital as well as analog TV decoder. So depending on the TV, if it's a 15 kilohertz only TV, 240p and 480i should work fine. Uh, if it's a TV that also supports 480p, um, you might get some lag because some of those late model CRTs had the same type of processors in them that flat screens did. Um, and those tended to process the image to add a bit of lag to it. So um, I would just give it a try because if you have a CRT potentially with component video inputs, you've already won. So uh, give it a try and see what happens. Um, PlayStation 2 is probably a, a great way to test it because um, it'll output 480i. But I mean, you could do anything with component inputs just to try it out. Uh, and if you get that weird split screen thing, that means you're sending in a 480p signal and it does not uh, does not support that mode. Um, and if for whatever reason you plug any of these things in and you don't get a signal or you get a weird signal, turn it off right away. You don't want to mess with compatibility, but um, certainly seems safe to just try for a few seconds and see what happens. It's a Serial Wow was just chiming in on a couple of past Q&As. Um, so one suggestion for people that want to use Nintendo DS on a TV is to mod a Wii U. Um, that's a good suggestion too. There's going to be a lot of lag there though. So uh, if you're playing on a, from like a Wii U onto uh, a CRT of sorts or a gaming monitor, that would be awesome. But if you're going through a standard TV with two frames of lag, you're going to get, I mean, it's noticeable. I had to, I couldn't beat new Super Mario Brothers um, on my flat screen, which only has about two frames of lag. I had to go and switch over to a CRT bit just to, to save those extra little bits. Um, so yes, that will absolutely work. And I probably should have mentioned it. It's just not original hardware and you will get software emulation lag. Um, 
Also, uh, in, about the RetroTINK in Corio always outputting a signal. Um, you can mod the Corio now with a, a further firmware update so that it automatically goes off when there's no signal detected, which makes it a lot easier for automated setups. You do need a special programmer for it, which is respectfully it's annoying you know i know that it, it adds cost to a product and development time and i know it's i know it sucks to add a usb controller in there to do this but it also sucks for everybody that wants to update their product so i'm glad mike integrated that into all of the newer retro tink pro, uh, products um, and hopefully you know the core U version 2 might would have that as well but i do agree that i think that more products should be able to uh should be able to automatically turn themselves off. Um, it's just sometimes it's a lot more complicated than adding that to the code. Sometimes you would actually have to add a different power circuit and then a different logic chip. And while I, I'm not an expert at this stuff, I could confidently say it's not as easy as it seems in every case. Um, and lastly, uh, any special plans for Q&A number 100 to celebrate, uh, which would be next week, I guess. Um, no, with everything going on, I totally forgot, to be honest with you. But let me see if I could come up with something neat. Maybe I'll do it live so you all could laugh at how many mistakes I make and see all my, my reshoots of this. <laughs> ABO Hiccups wants to know if I'm going to do videos on how to get light guns working on flat screen TVs. Uh, no, uh, it just doesn't really work that well. Um, you could use the Duck Hunt patch for the zapper, but you would have to use find a third party zapper that's compatible and that worked okay. I mean, that was enough where like I, I played it for a few minutes and it wasn't super accurate, but it wasn't bad. That was fun. I talked to the developer directly. Um, he seemed pretty awesome as well. Uh, and there's a bunch of other stuff out there that's emulation based, which seems cool as well, but it's not original hardware. Uh, not that I'm saying that you shouldn't or that you shouldn't use emulation. It's just not really the things that I tend to focus on. Uh, but there were a few different projects, and I think the one that just worked the best was using a modded Wii and a Wii Mote with uh, like the gun adapter. Those like two dollar plastic adapters that you jam the Wii Mote into, and there's uh, a cursor on the screen. And it's kind of, you know, it's a lot easier because now you have a cursor rather than trying to aim through the sight on the light gun. But um, that seemed to work perfect. So that's probably the best one for you at the moment. Um, and of course, you could go through all the stuff like the USB light guns for PCs and uh, any kind of any kind of emulation where it's motion tracking with the cursor on the screen. Uh, but now I just I have so many videos that I really want to work on and I just don't have enough time in the day So doing a video on something that only works. Okay, isn't really at the top of my list for now uh, Maybe someday though Dave Phipps wants to know what are the Famicom games that have enhanced sound quality? Um, so there's cartridges and discs that both have enhanced sound. So cartridges are things like Castlevania 3, discs are like Zelda and Metroid. Um, Bad Reality posted a link to Nestev that has the full list. Um, I believe it's incomplete, but uh, there's still, you know, th it's still a great place to start from. And next will the following uh, devices play the expansion audio sound. Retro USB AVS, definitely. Analog NT Mini, yes. Original Analog NT, uh, I don't know, I think so, but it's been a long time since I've even uh, even talked about one of those, to be honest. I think so. And the Retron 5, I think so as well, but just a note on that one. If you don't already own the Retron 5, I would never recommend it. Uh, it's just too expensive. If that was like 50 bucks, then sure, you know, what a cool way to try out games from, or cartridges from different consoles that you don't own and kind of see if this is something you want to spend money on or if you're only going to play a Famicom game once a year. So what the heck, I'll just leave it on the Retron. But, you know, if you already own it, cool, but I just wouldn't recommend buying one because it's so expensive and it's... The quality varies greatly in the emulation lag. Some of it is very laggy, some of it's just okay. Plus the whole drama about the whole stolen software on that and everything. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't recommend buying it, but if you already own it, it seems like a good enough thing just to get yourself started. Mr. Pete1985 wanted to know if the Unibios is a hacked BIOS or is it completely written from scratch? I always assumed it was a hacked BIOS and wondered if Resolu would even be able to sell it legally. I honestly have no idea. That's a pretty good question. I just, uh, I know how well it works. I can certainly stand for, for that much of it, but that's a really good question. Um, I mean, maybe email them and ask. Um, maybe there's a pretty cool story behind it, but uh, I have no personal info on that one. Sorry. 
ABO Hiccups has a couple of questions about, uh, I guess, maintenance and cleaning of stuff. Um, first, how do you clean the controllers from sweaty hands and how do we prevent that? Um, I don't think there's any way to prevent it. I got a bunch of friends that have OCD levels of cleanliness, yet their controllers are still kind of gross. Uh, but I just use the same cleaning method that I have listed on the website, which is essentially disassemble everything, take the plastic pieces and scrub them with a brush and either goo gone and then dish detergent or just dish detergent. Uh, use a plastic bristled brush so you don't scratch anything. The one I've had, you can get at any supermarket and you, you just it never scratched a single thing. Um, so that's that's the best way to do it. I generally do that every time I get a new controller. And then after a while, I guess if things if things are out and they have that layer of dust on them, you know how it kind of feels like greasy, even though it's just a layer of dust. Sometimes I'll redo it with that, which leads me to your next question. What's the number one best solution to keep dust away from all gaming's uh, setup? You could try dust covers. You could try those uh, Swiffer dry wipes where you could basically just wipe things down every couple of days so it never gets that layer of film on it. Um, Mark from My Life in Gaming puts his controllers in Ziploc bags uh, and in a box. I used to keep them all in like um, Ikea style boxes or like uh, like legal bankers boxes. I don't know. There's a di million different words for them, but it's the type that, uh, you know, with the, the fancier box with the top on it, those help. I mean, it's dust still gets in, but it's not as bad. Um, so it's basically just either covering, keeping things covered or constantly wiping things down. Um, there's no perfect solution. I think if I had the... Uh, I think if I had an office the size that I would have liked, I would take uh, Dan's idea and hang all my controllers upside down so the wires are dangling to keep the wires nice and straight so you don't have that crimping or anything. Um, and I would just hit it with a, a dry Swiffer duster thing every couple of days, just and that would be it. Um, I think that would be kind of the best of everything. But I don't know, I, it's kind of more about what you use or, or what's best for your setup. Um, and having so many things in boxes for me, I actually don't have to worry about it now. One of the few advantages of having everything in boxes. Bad Reality would like a suggestion on how to repair a Sonic 3 cartridge that no longer saves. And I've actually never run into that before. Um, I would first try to find whatever chip is already on there to see if you could find new old stock or in the, the rare case that they still make them. Um, and if not, I, I would just kind of look and see what other people do. Maybe try Console 5. Their store has every kind of replacement part you could imagine. I just don't really have any good advice because it's not something I've ever had to deal with before. So my apologies. You know, knowing my luck, though, the next time I go fi fire up my Sonic 3 cartridge, I'm going to have the same exact problem and have to go down this rabbit hole anyway. So uh, I promise if I do, I'll do at least a post on it to help other people. Bradley Cooper wanted to know if I could tell us a little about the guitar and bass I have hung on my wall. What are they? Am I primarily a guitar player who fakes the playing of bass, or is it the other way around? Uh, I would love to tell everybody about this, but I saved this question for last just in case no one cares, which is totally fair, by the way. But uh, I am a guitar player. I've been playing since I was 13 years old. Um, I enjoy bass very much, but I own a bass just because I need to sometimes put down a bass line on a recording. Um, but I, I am not a good bassist. I could play bass with a pick good enough where a non-musician might think that I was okay, but any bassist would look right at me and be freaking guitar player trying to play bass again. Uh, I do enjoy playing with my hands as well, but I just stink at it because, you know, not only would I have, I would have to relearn and then kind of also unlearn some of the, the ways I hold my hand for guitar because you got to hold your hand in a different place paying, pl uh, in a different place while playing bass like that. So uh, Davey504 would be pretty upset with me because I, I do play with a pick. Um, but the guitar is a completely custom Dave Mustaine Model Dean. And I, I have been through so many guitars. I am so picky. Every time I get one I'd like, there, there's something about it that I want to change. And I found that guitar on eBay. And the, the points on the bottom were all smashed up. It was dinged up. It was in pretty bad condition. And I went, perfect. Now I have a beater guitar that I don't care about, that I could throw in a soft bag and bring it to practice. And if uh, something ever breaks, I could just take it all apart and try to make a different one. And it was even a bit of drama when I got it. The guy just put it in a box with no padding. Uh, and then like, when I asked for some kind of refund, he flipped out. I had to go through eBay eBay's whatever thing for that. It was all kind of mind blowing. So I don't really know what the deal with that was, but I got the guitar and I really liked it. 
and I figured, all right, let me put some work into it. I love that it's the Rust in Peace model because that album, Rust in Peace, is why I play guitar. Like, you know, I was a kid that loved music, so if you're a kid and you don't know any better, you most likely just want to be a singer. And then when I saw Slash stand up on the piano during the November Rain video, I was like, I think I want to play guitar. And then when I heard Rust in Peace, the whole album, by the time I got to Tornado of Souls, it wasn't, I think I want to play guitar. It was, I need to play guitar. So having, you know, the Rust in Peace, let me see if I can, you know, I don't think autofocus is going to work, but yeah, it's uh, I'll, I'll post a picture of it if anybody wants. So I, I started doing a little bit of work to it. And then coincidentally, I found through a, a good friend of mine, a guitar tech, uh, who she recommended, and you know, she definitely vouched for him. And every guitar tech I've ever been to doesn't understand how I play guitar. Whether it's a tech who works with metal guitarists, a tech that works with jazz guitarists, I, I play guitar, rhythm guitar for heavy metal, but I approach guitar with some percussion elements as well. So I'm hitting the strings really hard, so they always bounce off the frets. So it's gotta be, you have to set up a guitar a very specific way. So for my whole life, I would end up spending a hundred bucks to get a really good setup done, or depending, you know, 50 to a hundred, depending what else needed to be done. And then I'd have to take it home and then kind of redo it myself a little bit. And I found this one person and by the way, I went to, I didn't go to like, you know, just random places or guitar center or something. I went to people that are supposedly known for being amazing guitar techs. One of them even has a hundred thousand dollar guitar and he's famous and he did the worst job, by the way. I, I went to this one person and he did such an amazing job. I just went, like I called him on the phone afterwards. Like, you don't understand. I didn't have to do anything after you got it home. He's like, yeah, it's, it's what I do. I'm like, no, 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 you don't get it. Like, this is perfect. What else could we do? So we talked about it and he filed down the sides where the points were broken off and painted it black. So it actually looks cool. It looks like the points kind of come down sharp at the end. Um, uh, and now, so now it's like, it's still beat up. So I don't feel bad if it gets dinged, but it also looks even cooler. Um, and then he grinded down the frets so that they were all kind of evened out, but closer to the fretboard, which works better with the way I play. Um, and then he hand wound the pickups for it because I do like, I don't like active pickups because as somebody who treats guitar like a percussion instrument, sometimes when I smack the string with a pick, I want a specific sound. And other times if I'm just picking a note, I want a different sound. And a lot of times with active pickups, you just get a sound, <laughs> which is awesome. I love active pickups for that reason but you know for the stuff that i play and when i record i want it really i want it every hit that i that i do to come out the way that i mean it to i guess um so i he hand wound two pickups uh and they're they're both split um and individual so you could have neck both or bridge and then each individual pickup could be split into single or dual coil and it's my favorite guitar I've ever owned. And I've owned a lot. I had a double neck Dave Mustaine V. Um, I had, uh, I mean, I had a bunch of Dave Mustaine models. I even had an original, the first year that they ever had the Dave Mustaine model Jackson. It was serial number DM057. And when I bought it, it was hanging up at a guitar store for $750, $750. And I, I bought it and I, I looked up the serial number and I couldn't, I couldn't find uh, anything about it. So I emailed Jackson and I got an email a couple days later, like, Hey, we're really sorry. We think you got a fake, um, you know, please let us know. Did you buy it new? Where did you get it? And I, to be honest, I was like, you know, it's a great guitar. I love the way it plays. It was 750. It was cheaper than some of the other models they had at the time. Uh, it was supposedly used. Um, so I was cool with it. I still enjoyed it. And about six months later, I get an email from the vice president of Jackson guitar saying, Hey, we did an investigation about that guitar because we were worried that somebody was out there selling fakes. And we found out that that wasn't a fake. That was an original first year Dave Mustaine model before they started signing the headstock. And you had 50, I think it was 57 of a hundred or something like that. So I had like one of the originals. I ended up, um, I had something bad happened like 10 years ago. So I ended up having to sell that and pretty much everything else I owned. But I had a bunch of really amazing guitars is the, the very short way of saying that long story. Um, I, guitars that I loved. And the one that's behind me is by far the best I've ever played. I had a couple that I hand built myself and pieced together from when I was a kid um, that were like a Kramer Voyager style. So like old school Eddie Van Halen. But one of my friends... <laughs> One of my friends, when I started playing in bands, I would play it live uh, and they pulled me aside and they're like, 
you are a large man with a small guitar. You just look silly playing that thing. Go back to playing Vs. I know you love your old style star-shaped Kramer Voyager guitar, but go back to the bigger ones that fit you better. You look less silly up there. So uh, I do, I, I think the, the V is my favorite style anyway. So yeah, that's that's the history of all of that stuff. Um, I, I was in a couple of bands. I was making music, but retro RGB for years now has taken up every moment of my time. And I love it. I'm certainly not complaining about that. But every every couple of weeks, I'll think of a game plan on how I'm going to get back into recording and finish the you know recording album two that's been done for years that I just never got around to finishing. And every time I make a set time to do that, I ended up going late on another project and next thing you know, it's midnight and I got to go to bed. So uh, I absolutely want to want to continue music. I just got to get everything else in life straightened away first. But um, and in fact, if I could do I, some of the greatest feelings in life were playing in front of large crowds, especially and this might be selfish, but playing my songs in front of large crowds, my songs, meaning any band I was in that wasn't playing a cover song, you know, even if I just wrote half a riff to one song, it still was really amazing to be to be up in front of sometimes pretty large groups. One of the bands I was in got pretty popular for a while. So I think a couple hundred people was the most we ever played in front of. And it was an absolute blast. It's also why I don't normally get nervous talking in front of crowds because, you know, when you're up in front of people that are, are not there to see you, if they're there to see the headlining band, you, you got to win them over or you're going to get a bunch of people just walking to the bar very angry that they have to sit through your set. So it's, uh, you know, dealing with a couple of those and learning and earning that crowd where they, you know, everybody saw us. We weren't one of the headliners. So they left for the bar. And by the last song, they came back. That was awesome. That was like a pretty amazing feeling. So I'd love to get back into that. Um, I'm friends with the best drummer I have ever played with ever. And uh, he's in other bands, but he always still wants to do stuff with me. So uh, Answer Infinity is a, a very good friend of mine. That The whole band are good friends of mine. Uh, I see them every chance I can, and they always offer to help. Um, so hopefully I'll end up finishing it. But Sorry for ranting for 10 minutes about uh, music stuff. I did want to, I did warn everybody at the beginning, so I wanted to save it for last in case anybody wanted to just skip over that. But yeah, any more music questions, let me know. And I'll, you know, I, I even want to start doing a video series on the weird way I play guitar. Uh, only like heavy metal rhythm guitarists or Spanish acoustic guitarists will care. But, you know, it's something I would like to make time for, even if nobody watches it, I just would enjoy it. So hopefully we'll see that someday. I'd have to start another channel though. That's certainly not a fit on retro RGB. That'd be weird for me to post it there, but maybe I'll just create a personal channel and just make a couple of those videos and some other weirdness that's not a good fit here. But thanks for asking. And uh, yeah, anything about music? Um, you know, obviously the tech side of music was a giant part of my life for a long time. So. Uh, while I'm certainly not as up to date as a lot of my other friends, I could probably help there as well. And a tip to any metal guitarist or anybody that uses distortion, get a freaking noise gate. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen live shows where every time somebody stops playing, there's feedback. Just the ISP decimator for anybody that uses distortion. It's the easiest trick in the book. It's not that expensive. It doesn't hurt the sound of your guitar. Just automatically cuts it off so there's no crazy feedback between notes. Anybody still here after that long rant about music? <laughs> if so, thanks for sticking around. I really do love doing these Q&As. I really, it feels like I get to hang out with you in a weird way, even though these are pre-recorded and not live. I don't know. I, I enjoy them and hopefully you all do too. Um, and for anybody that's new to this, please just ask any question that you have in the newest support uh, page wherever it is that you support so this one's going to be i believe number 99 so if you have a question for next week find support number 99 and post your question there for youtube algorithm reasons i have to read the comments on youtube or i have to leave the comments on on youtube but i don't generally read them because this is really just a way for me to interact with supporters and it's a small way that i try to say thank you to all of you for your help so thank you all very much and i will see you all next week